various websites. Former president of the Warren Astronomical Society, former president of vice president of Warren Astronomical Society, former outreach director of the Warren Astronomical Society, and former president of the Great Lakes Association of Astronomy Clubs. Anything that I missed? Oh, okay. <laughs> Diane's going to do a great presentation on uh, uh, Columbia and Eagle, which are the, the Apollo 11 spacecraft. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Yep, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I just, just yes, jump in one absolutely. second? Uh, I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, I just looked down and remembered something quickly here. Um, if you know who Harlan Moville is, um, he's been out here several times. I think three times he's done presentations. And uh, he's a, uh, a retired flight engineer um, who did six Apollo flights, including Apollo 11. He is responsible for navigation and guidance, and he's 88 years old. And they put him in the, the front page of the Detroit News today. So if you get a chance, take a look at him. He was here, and it sounded like he was going to come as a civilian, as a guest, but uh, they opted to take him elsewhere, I think. Right. Bob, Bob knows where, as a different celebration. So this is really cool for him, and I just wanted you to know. This is available online, too, if you want to find it. So, okay, sorry, Dan. No problem at all. It's great news. All right. Lights, camera, action? <laughs> yes. Okay, so I started off my previous version of this at Cranbrook with uh, asking everybody if they knew who Neil Armstrong was. I think we're set on that question. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get into it. Can I steal your uh, stick? Yeah, switch. You switch the controller to me. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Armstrong's earlier line, the first word spoken upon the moon, Houston, the eagle has landed, are a strong contender for second. Those are the, the two money quotes. Eagle, of course, refers to the lunar module, the LEM, this part of the Apollo 11 spacecraft that actually touched down on the moon. This bug-like LEM, which we have several models up here, is designed to function in low gravity conditions outside the atmosphere of Earth. It really can't function any other way. And it's become an iconic symbol of the space age all on its own. And out of the LEMS, the eagle is the most iconic of all. However, there is a second part to the spacecraft. Columbia, the command and service module, also featured in several models here tonight. The mission could not have succeeded without them because this was where the astronauts actually lived during their commute to and from their work site, AKA the moon. It's also the only part of the Apollo 11 spacecraft that was equipped with a heat shield that could get them safely back through the Earth's atmosphere in one piece. Columbia started her existence as CSM-107. She was built by the Space and Information Systems Division of what was then called North American Aviation, later known as North American Rockwell, in Downey, California. Uh, NAA also had the contract to build the second stage of the Saturn V rocket. We really won't talk about the Saturn V rocket tonight. It honestly deserves a talk all to itself. We're going to focus on the part of the spacecraft the astronauts lived in and flew. So this is actually not down at Downey, but at the VAB, the massive vertical assembly building in um, the Kennedy Space Center where the Saturn V rockets and the other spacecraft and later the shuttles were assembled. So the development of the CSM had big problems. It was marked by tension between the astronauts and the North American engineers who were viewed as unresponsive to astronaut input. 
Now, the previous phase of the Moonshot Program Project Gemini had been contracted out to McDonnell Douglas in Missouri. And this guy here, Gus Grissom, the second American to, or to be in space at all with his suborbital flight, he had a great relationship with the guys at McDonnell Douglas, to the point where the other astronauts started calling the little two-seater Gemini the Gusmobile. <laughs> it was customized. It was his baby. Astronauts loved it. I mean, you didn't really want to be in one for 12 weeks, but it was still a good machine. Not so with the CSM being built by North America. Um, there were a lot of problems to the point where Grissom left a lemon in the simulator there for, rather than write a manifesto, he hung up a lemon. So here is Grissom and his prospective crewmates on what would be the first Apollo mission, Ed White, the first spacewalker, and Roger Chaffee, the youngest, who would have been the youngest astronaut to fly to date, um, from Michigan. They're happy, they're smiling. And then they sent their boss a different shot where they are praying over the capsule <laughs> and letting him know they're going over his head. Unfortunately, their prayers were not answered. The CSM assigned to them, CSM-12, had faulty wiring during a test in a pressurized full oxygen environment on the launch pad at Cape Kennedy a spark in the capsule caused a fire that killed the astronauts within seconds. So Grissom, White, and Chaffee died. The mission was, uh, has been posthumously commemorated as Apollo 1. Originally, it wouldn't even, even have had a proper name. In the aftermath of this, North American and NASA did a full, thorough investigation, did get to the bottom of the problem, and a better, safer work, work culture came out of it. The new CSMs produced at Downey had better wiring. They had a safer hatch instead of one that would trap people inside during an inferno. And all in all, more than 1,340 design changes. Some astronauts even estimate it was more like 5,000. I went with the more conservative number. So that was the development of the CSM. Meanwhile, um, oh, though they weren't perfect. This is Apollo 13, CSM Odyssey, infamously had a tank rupture on the outward bound journey. The astronauts had to get in the limb, use it as a lifeboat, and come home. Had this happened on the return journey with no limb, they would have died. But the development of the limb had its own problems. The limb was subcontracted out to Grumman Aerospace Corps out of Bethpage, Long Island. And they had their own issues developing and assembling this incredibly quirky vehicle like nothing that humans had ever constructed before. Uh, the LEMS were not ready for their first scheduled mission at the close of 1968. So this led to a mission in which the guys in Apollo 8 just took a CSM and went around the moon, came back in one piece, no LEM. The LEM was still being worked on. So the way that Apollo, like Gemini before it worked, was you had missions that built in the successes and learned from the challenges of previous missions. Apollo 7, the first successful manned mission, tested out the CSM. Put some guys in it, put it up in the air, see what happens. CSM worked fine. Apollo 8 tested both the mighty Saturn V rocket and the CSM in lunar orbit. Can we get people to the moon and bring them home safely? The answer was yes. But we still didn't know at this time, and this is the end of 1968, how the LEM was going to perform. But NASA had a calendar that was all planned out, and according to the internal calendar, a combination of CSM 107 and LEM number 5 would go to the moon and land in July of 1969. The astronauts were not too sure about that. The guys assigned to this particular combination of CSM-107 and LEM-5 were all Gemini veterans. They'd all flown in space once before. They'd all had successful, if dangerous, missions. And success, in some cases, a little qualified. We'll talk about that. So we've got Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Michael Collins, LEM Pilot Buzz Aldrin. They knew when they got the mission, this might be the one to go to the moon but they weren't betting on it. However, to the eyes of the public, these were the chosen three. 
Astronauts had always had to deal with photographers interfering in their lives. Life magazine actually had a deal with NASA to have exclusive access to astronauts, their wives, their kids. They were used to the attention. The attention that the families began to get was unprecedented. So here's, we've got the Collins family, the Aldrin family, and the Armstrong family beginning to get used to the spotlight. Meanwhile, the LEM finally flew in March, whoop, 1969. LEM-3, gumdrop, flew in a higher order. And rendezvous, the meeting of the LEM and the CSM in space and the docking thereof was achieved. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. In May of 1969, the whole contraption went off to the moon. So all of the pieces were coming together for full-scale dress rehearsal. Saturn V, LEM, CSM, docking, undocking, coming back together, coming home. Everything except the landing and the ascent from the lunar surface. This, again, was May. We were still on track for July to be the big one. So the crew. Most Apollo crews were known for being tight-knit. Pairs of deeply bonded friends, trios of friends, people who drove together, even drove matching cars together, lunched together, fished together, joked together. Many of them had already bonded during Gemini missions, and there's really no way to get to know a guy like spending 12 days strapped into a spacecraft the size of a VW bug with him. <laughs> you, get, you get to learn a lot about somebody that way. <clears throat> this was not the case with these three. They had never worked closely together before being assigned to this mission. And they were now thrust into a intense six-month training. Collins, who dubbed them amiable strangers, he has a bit of a way with words, as we'll see, called it a terse and busy six months. So Neil Armstrong, who, as I said, I don't think he needs any introduction, but Casey does, native of Wapakoneta, Ohio, a few, mile, a few hours south of here. He earned his pilot's license by the time he was 16, so he wasn't even legally old enough to drive, and he could fly. He attended Purdue University, studied engineering, served as a naval aviator during the Korean War, and he became a civilian test pilot for what was then the National Advisory Commission on Aeronautics, the forerunner of NASA. So Armstrong was in the position of actually working for NASA before he became an astronaut, which did give him a bit of a leg up in the selection process when he decided he did want to be an astronaut. So with NACA, he flew uh, seven missions to the X-15, reached a peak altitude of 39.3 miles, and uh, went more than five times the speed of sound. He also participated in the short-lived, unsuccessful dinosaur space plane project. After the death of his young daughter Karen from a brain tumor in 1962, Armstrong sought a career change, and he was selected as one of the new nine astronauts. So the original seven were the seven guys picked for Mercury, all of the military test pilots. With the new nine, they were looking at a bit broader experience, so they were allowing some civilian pilots in, Armstrong and this guy here, and they were looking for um, engineering experience as well as simply flying experience. At this point, the, uh, the space race was on. The Soviet Union's early successes with the Vostok missions had triggered a full-scale race between superpowers. President Kennedy had made his speech, you know, we choose to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Well. They needed some additional brain power for it. So Armstrong stood out less for his crack piloting skills than for his comprehensive and thoughtful approach to engineering. He was also known for being slightly disorganized and really averse to exercise. <laughs> so he was the first spacefarer, Russian or US, to successfully dock two spacecraft during his Gemini 8 mission. Um, the Gemini were the two-person missions that preceded the Apollo program. His mission unfortunately ended after only 10 hours because a stuck thruster on the Gemini craft caused it to tumble wildly to the point that Armstrong and his co-pilot, Dave Scott, were about to lose consciousness. Armstrong had to save them by aborting the mission. But they came down safely, and Armstrong stood out for having a cool head in a life-threatening crisis. So even though the mission was kind of a failure, 
In terms of everything they intended to accomplish, he had accomplished docking, which was the big one, and they were alive. And uh, the cool thing in the crisis is really a trademark of his. So this guy here is the, um, oh, it's the uh, lunar lander trainer, this weird bug-like contraption. So there it explodes. And here he comes down. What would you do after an escape like that? You probably wouldn't do what he did, which is go back to the office to start working on paperwork. He shared an office with a younger astronaut named Alan Bean. Uh, Bean was, you know, got a phone call. Hey, you know, I heard something happened to Neil. No, nothing happened to Neil. He's right here. Neil, hey, did you almost blow up? Yeah. No big deal. No big deal. Nothing, nothing exciting. On the downside, this preternatural detachment put a bit of a strain on his personal life. His wife and kids are on the record as saying things like, with Neil, no is an argument. Silence is an answer. And this photo, it's a pretty telling photo. This is from his own family's website. Okay, they released these candid photographs to show the human side of him. Okay. One of my heroes, but I don't know that I want to, you know, live at close quarters with the guy. Next to the pecking order came a very different personality in Michael Collins. Collins was an Air Force test pilot. He was an army brat, as they say. He was born in Rome into a family of career army officers. He moved so often as a child that he had no hometown. So when he first became an astronaut, you normally get a hometown parade. He had no hometown, no parade for him. He was fine with that. He didn't really want one. But he ultimately began to think of Washington, D.C. as his hometown. He graduated from West Point, and he joined the Air Force rather than the Army to avoid the appearance of nepotism. He applied twice to be an astronaut, and he was accepted the second time, along with these guys, who were called the Next 14. So we've got original seven, new nine, Next 14. And there's some familiar faces here. We've got Collins, we've got Buzz Aldrin, we've got Gene Cernan, the last guy to walk on the moon, and again, Michigan's own Roger Chaffee down there in the corner. He was a respected test pilot. His area of expertise within NASA became spacesuits and spacewalks. He became the first person ever, again, US or Russian, to walk in space twice when he did two spacewalks on his Gemini 10 mission. Um, he was enthusiastic about celestial navigation to the point where he named his dog Dube after one of the stars <laughs> that they used in the astronaut program. So his uh, co-pilot here, John Young, dubbed him Magellan. Collins was originally slated to be on Apollo 8, the mission that first saw the far side of the moon and took the iconic Earthrise photo. But he began developing issues with his leg. It started giving out on him when he was running. He would feel cold where it shouldn't be cold, hot where it should be cold. Ultimately, it was a bone spur and he needed neck surgery. So he had to have a cervical fusion to treat it. That knocked him off the mission, so instead, a guy called Jim Lovell joined Frank Borman and Bill Anders on the very first trip around the moon. Um, once Collins recovered from surgery, he was assigned to Neil Armstrong's mission, bumping off a guy named Fred Hayes, to whom Collins apologized because he felt bad. But the fates of the guys from Apollo 13 and Apollo 11 were actually pretty intimately intertwined with one another. Collins described himself as nothing special in, in the context of all the overachievers in the astronaut group. But to his fellow astronauts, he was known for his discipline, his clean living, he was an avid runner, he preferred rose gardening to partying, and he was called a bright, capable, classy, and incredibly funny by his comrade John Lee. <coughs> and if you've heard any of the recent interviews with Collins, that's still true today at the age of 88. Then there's the third guy. Buzz Aldrin, remembered by John Young, not as bright, capable, classy, and incredibly funny, but as another sort of man altogether, the kind of guy who gets on people's nerves. At least one senior astronaut, Frank Borman, did openly did not want Aldrin on any of his missions. He was initially declined for lack of test pilot experience, but with the group of 14 who were on average younger and better educated than any of their predecessors, 
fighter pilot experience like Alden had in Korea counted as well as the test pilot experience that had previously been a credential. And then Aldrin had a doctorate from MIT, which really made him stand out. His doctorate was in astronautics with a focus on manned orbital rendezvous. And rendezvous, specifically lunar orbit rendezvous, happened to be NASA's plan of how you get a spacecraft of people to the moon and get them back. This very complicated diagram, I could almost you know, do it more clearly with the toys over there, you have a liftoff of a giant rocket with two different spacecraft in it. As the rocket is on its way to the moon, the two spacecraft dock as they emerge from the shell of the big rocket. They then go to the moon. One piece comes off and goes down. Another piece keeps orbiting. Then the smaller piece comes back, rejoins in lunar orbit, gets jettisoned, and then one little bit of the spacecraft finally comes back to Earth. Very complicated, very intricate, and the Gemini program was all about mastering the steps that would be necessary to do that. This was something that eluded the Soviet cosmonauts and engineers all through this time. They were not mastering rendezvous. So, he had the smarts, but he wasn't originally supposed to even fly. He was assigned in what looked like a dead-end job as the backup commander to Gemini 12. That was the last mission in the Gemini series. So backup commander on the last thing means you're not going to fly. But then the guys who were assigned to Gemini 9 died in a plane crash. And the crew placement changed. And suddenly, Aldrin and senior pilot Jim Lovell were the guys doing Gemini 12. Aldrin did five and a half hours of incredibly successful spacewalking that again built on everything that had been learned in all the prior spacewalks. Gemini 12 was a triumph, and Aldrin had proved he was more than just an egghead. So Neil Armstrong, at the close of 1968, was given a choice. Donald Deke Slayton, the head of the astronaut office, said, okay, you can take Aldrin or you can take Lovell. Buzz is difficult to work with. Armstrong went home, and he slept on it. And the next day, he said to Slayton that he and Buzz were getting along OK. Not a ringing endorsement, but good enough. And besides that, Armstrong felt Lovell deserved his own command, whereupon Lovell was placed in the rotation for what would become Apollo 13. So here's Neil and Buzz training together. Not really, as I said, the most, the most friendly group of guys, but I did like Armstrong's quote. As an old Navy guy, I think I did remarkably well in getting on with two Air Force guys. <laughs> There's definitely some Air Army, Navy, Air Force tension running through the astronaut group back then. Probably still is. Jim Lovell did make a contribution to Apollo 11. He suggested they make an eagle as the patch design. Michael Collins, being the artistic type, picked up a National Geographic book called Water Prey and Game Birds of North America and started making eagle sketches. So initially you've got this eagle, with its talons out, you've got full moon, full earth in the background, Roman numerals, names around the rim. And it evolved into this. Olive branch in the talons to look more peaceful. Arabic numerals for worldwide accessibility. No names to symbolize the achievement of all of humanity rather than just three guys in a spacecraft. And an earth that, while picturesque, is at the wrong angle. You will never see this phase of Earth from the moon. This design choice led to the crew naming their lab Eagle. Alden, uh, Alden and Armstrong thought it sounded good on the radio, which is, it was a call sign. You want it to sound good and crisp on the radio. But that means that Collins needed a name for his CSM. Now, the use of unique astronaut chosen call signs for the spacecraft had been discontinued during Project Gemini. But with Apollo, you've got two different parts. You can't just call it Apollo 11 because they split up. What are you going to do, call it Apollo 11 A and B? No, you need multiple call signs. So Apollo 9 had the CSM gumdrop and the LEM spider. And then Apollo 10 had Charlie Brown and Snoopy, thereby demonstrating why astronauts should not be allowed to name their spacecraft. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
So something more dignified was needed for the lunar landing, and it was actually a representative from NASA's own public affairs division who said, hey, Mike, what do you think about Columbia? And Collins initially was like, no, it's pompous. I don't like it. But then he thought about it, and the song Columbia, Gem of the Ocean came to mind. And he thought of Columbia on its return from a successful mission floating in the blue Pacific waiting to be rescued. He said, that's a good omen. We'll take it. Also, he couldn't think of anything better. <laughs> Meanwhile, the rest of the world was waiting for the big day. But of course, not everybody was preoccupied with Apollo 11 as there was a lot going on. For one thing, the Soviets were hoping something would happen. Not a fatality, but, you know, a rocket glitch or anything that would slow the Americans down and buy them enough time to get their N1 rocket up and running. By the time Apollo 10 happened, they knew they, the only thing that would help them was something wrong on the American side. Soviets aside, there was plenty going on in the States. Vietnam was raging. Major riots and rebellions had taken place in cities like Detroit. This is Detroit only two years prior. 1968 had been a terrible year featuring, among other bad things, the assassinations of Dr. King and Robert Kennedy. And then Nixon had just been inaugurated. Nixon was not exactly universally beloved. So it was a deeply polarized, upsetting time. And in the middle of this, Dr. King's successor at the Southern Christian Leadership Council, uh, Ralph Abernathy, said, why are we prioritizing sending people to the moon when we have war, we have hunger, we have poverty, we have children suffering? So he actually asked for and got a meeting with NASA Administrator Tom Paine. He took the Poor People's Campaign, which King had worked with before his assassination, down to the Kennedy Space Center right before the launch, got his meeting with Payne. Payne kind of patted him on the head and said, you know, if, if we could s solve all these problems that by not pushing the launch button tomorrow, we wouldn't push the launch button. And then he invited Abernathy to come see the launch the next day, which he accepted. So let's just say it's an argument that we've not yet solved, how to prioritize. It's part of the reason we haven't really sorted out what we're doing next as far as manned space flight goes. But to Abernathy and many others, it was just a case of misplaced priorities. He said, we may go from this day to Mars to Jupiter and the heavens beyond, but as long as racism and poverty and hunger prevail, we, we're failing as a civilized nation. And it's a debate still worth having. Back inside NASA, there was a different kind of tension going on. Aldrin was campaigning to be the first guy to step out of the lab. And he wasn't subtle about it. He tried to get the other lunar module pilots on his side, like Gene Sermon. And uh, it didn't go well. You can say <laughs> that it was self-promotion, but Aldrin had a very strong sense of how historic and how meaningful this was. And he felt that it would change the world. And he seems to have been, maybe not even irritated, but perturbed. By the way, Armstrong in particular treated it like it was another day at the office, another day at the simulator. He didn't feel that Armstrong had a full sense of what this would mean to the world, and he did. So Deke Slayton, again the head of the astronaut office, did his best to defuse the issue. He personally told other, look, Neil is probably going to be the first guy out of the limb. You need to simmer down. Aldrin took it okay, but then he told his dad. And Edwin Jean Edwin Aldrin Sr. had some issues. And it ended up being appealed even further up the NASA food chain until finally on April 14th, NASA said, Neil Armstrong is stepping out first. We're done. They had a lot of reasons. His personality, the precedent of a commander stepping off his ship, as in the great age of great exploration, and simply, you know, where people's seats were, where people's backpacks were. Aldrin seems to have been okay with the technical explanation more than anything else, or at least he accepted it. So when you've got guys with this much tension going on, the thing you want to do is lock them all in a room for a month, right? <laughs> One month before 
launch, the Apollo 11 crew moved into the quarters on Merritt Island down by the Kennedy Space Center to train as much as they could with as little interference from the outside world as possible. Wives and children counting, of course, as outside interference. They stayed back in Houston. They had a maid. They had cooks. They had exercise equipment. And they had time to develop a close working relationship, right? And then things happened like one day Neil Armstrong crashed the LEM simulator and virtually killed himself and Buzz on impact. Alden had a bottle of scotch that night and he began unloading on Mike Collins, who really just wanted to go to bed, but he, he put up with it until the noise woke up Armstrong, who showed up in his pajamas and inserted himself in the argument, at which point Collins bailed off and went to bed. And we don't know what happened the rest of the night. They never spoke of it again. They pretended it had happened the next morning. But th again, this, this is what was going on on that mission. July 16th dawns, 1969. The crew had the ritual launch day breakfast, steak, eggs, juice, toast, and coffee. An artist from NASA, Paul Calais, was on hand to sketch them. Film crews were following their every moment. If you've seen the movie Apollo 11 that was released earlier this year, you'll, you've seen how intimately all these interactions were captured. They were pretending to be casual during what was really a highly orchestrated affair. After breakfast, they suited up. They went to launch pad 39A, where Columbian Eagle waited on top of a Saturn V rocket. Again, every moment was filmed. And the world was watching. I particularly like this one. This is a Berlin. People are standing outside a television window on launch day waiting to see the launch through the windows of the TV shop. You can find similar scenes from all around the world. So once they were on top of that rocket, Alden says he took a moment to reflect on the view from 363 feet up in the air. When Armstrong was asked, well, did you also take a time out to reflect on the view? He said, no, probably not. I was just thinking about the mission. And we have liftoff. 9.32 AM, Eastern Daylight Time. Ralph Abernathy was watching, and he said, he was proud. You know, he, whatever his reservations about the money being spent and where it was allocated, in that moment, it wasn't about hunger, it wasn't about poverty, it was about an accomplishment of human beings. They're in space. Everything checks out in orbit, it's time to head to the moon. Mike Collins had been the capsule communicator, CAPCOM, the only person at Mission Control allowed to talk directly to the astronauts uh, for Apollo 8, and he had given the crew the go-ahead for their very first trip to the moon. Go for TLI, for translunar injection. He thought that would be a thrilling moment. He's making history. He actually found it very sad. All the emotion was muted by jargon. Well, now he was the one in the capsule on the receiving end from the order, you know, Apollo 11, you would go for TLI. And Apollo 11 left Earth's gravity and went to the moon. Once they left Earth orbit, Eagle and Columbia emerged from the fairing of the Saturn V, and Collins did the rendezvous and docking to get this classic configuration which went moonbound, slowly turning on what's called a barbecue spin or a barbecue roll to keep it from overheating in the direct sunlight. You'd think that it would be peaceful up there. It wasn't. So the Capcom's on deck. Here's Charlie Duke, one of the four. Bombarded them. The morning news, bits of trivia, a general stream of chatter. Hey, when you're out there on the moon, be sure to keep look out for a beautiful lady with a rabbit hanging out under a cinnamon tree. <laughs> they had a spacecraft to run. They had medical sensors running. They had photo ops and videos to send down to Earth for the general delight of the public. They were busy virtually every moment. Even if only the Capcom on shift got to speak with them, it was still a draining and often irritating experience. And the other Capcoms being mostly fellow, being entirely fellow astronauts, knew it. It was just part of the routine. But the first orbit around the moon got the attention of all three astronauts. Collins looked at the craters and said, my gosh, they're monsters. He also dropped a few swear words, and it was a good thing they were on the far side of the moon and not in a hot mic, because that was a real no-no. But if you look at the transcripts on the far side, he's, he's saying some naughty words. 
Should have had a swear bank up there on Columbia. <laughs> they also got to see a solar eclipse on their journey. They uh, managed to take this picture of the solar corona around the huge moon. This was a treat several missions got to experience. Um, what they actually saw was incredible. The picture doesn't do it justice, but it was the only one they managed. And they got to see their very own version of Earthrise. But of course, they weren't there to sightsee. They're in lunar orbit. It's time for Armstrong and Aldrin to get on Eagle and attempt the landing. Collins was not looking forward to this. He hid his concerns beneath the quip, hey, you cats take it easy down there on the lunar surface. But from the moment they closed the hatch and undocked Eagle from Columbia, there was a non-zero chance he would be the only one coming home, and he knew it. This haunted him, it weighed heavily upon him. Ed White, who died in the Apollo 1 fire, had been a good friend of him, his. And also, he had been the one who had to break the news to Martha Chaffee that her husband Roger had died and comfort Martha all through the funeral process. And NASA doesn't seem to have been great shakes at giving people grief counselors or any sort of thing to deal with that kind of traumatic experience after the fact. Did he ever discuss his fears with the rest of the crew? No. It was something they all knew and they never talked about it with one another. Undocking successfully. Um, Armstrong announced his mission control by saying the Eagle has wings, and Eagle and Columbia were now two separate parts of the mission. Collins looked at the bug-like lamb floating away and said, I think you've got a fine-looking flying machine there, Eagle, despite the fact that you're upside down. To which Armstrong replied, knowing, of course, there is no upside down in microgravity. Somebody's upside down. And they went their separate ways. You've probably seen, heard, watched dramatizations. Eagle descended towards the designated landing site in the Sea of Tranquility. On approach, Armstrong realized autopilot was taking him into a crater filled with boulders the size of automobiles. He took over, which didn't mean operating actual sticks because it was computerized. He took over the input into the computer to guide Eagle to a safer location. And amid alarms from Eagle's overloaded computer, he touched down 17 seconds of fuel remaining. His voice stayed calm through the entire transmission, but his heart rate spiked from 77 beats per minute to 156. So he might not have liked some exercise, but he sure got it there. <laughs> Eagle was now the centerpiece of Tranquility Base, Population 2. The moment was so emotional that in Mission Control, Capcom Charlie Duke stammered out, Tranquility base. <laughs> uh, Walter Cronkite on CBS News, in the middle of his marathon broadcast, he removed his glasses the way he had when President Kennedy died, blinking away tears. A baseball game paused. Celebrations took place around the globe. Inside Eagle, Neil and Buzz shook hands, clasped one another on the shoulder, and Armstrong said, So far, so good. Let's get on with it. <laughs> But Aldrin had something deeply personal to do first. He was a devout Presbyterian, and he had brought, with the permission in his stash of personal possessions that all astronauts were allowed, a chalice and communion wine. And he called out, you know, for a moment of silence worldwide, a moment to reflect, trying to keep it as non-denominational as possible, and he took communion on the moon. Armstrong, who was not a member of any formal religious practice, looked on without participating or commenting. We do not know what is in his P Armstrong's own PKK because it's been um, sealed until next year. It is believed by family members that he probably took a memento of his daughter Karen and may have done something, possibly left it on a crater during a part of the spacewalk where it went off alone. But we don't know, and we may never know. Meanwhile, Mike Collins was the loneliest man in the universe, or the loneliest man since Adam, as NASA's own press release put it. He was 60 miles above Columbia and the lunar surface, and he was perfectly happy. He turned up the lights, he kept her running, he enjoyed not having anybody mouthing off at him. He said, the only thing that could mouth off at me is a Colossus 2A, and if it does, I'll unplug it. And the press made much of his solitude. He says he never felt lonely. He was glad of the peace and quiet. He really liked it every time he passed between the far side of the moon and mission control shut up for a while. But 
He missed the most famous moment of the entire mission because there was no TV on board Columbia, and even if there was, he was on the far side when six hours after touchdown, Armstrong opened the hatch. An estimated 20% of Earth's population watched Armstrong take his first steps on the lunar surface. In the US alone, 93% uh, of televisions were tuned in. So 20% of 3 billion is still a lot of people. The tra broadcast was transmitted by the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. And uh, as people watched, Neil collected a contingency sample of lunar rocks, which was needed to get some scientific stuff in case they had to get back in the limb and leave the moon immediately. And when it turned out they were okay to stay for a bit, Aldrin joined him on the surface. They took out the American flag, took a phone call, long distance phone call from President Nixon, and they read aloud from the plaque affixed to the leg of the limb that said, We came in peace for all mankind. That's still up there. Back on the home front, their families, is Joan Collins, and, or Joan Aldrin, Pat Collins, and Janet Armstrong, they were grappling with the enormity of all. Life was never going to be normal again. This is one of the few photos of Neil Armstrong on the moon. He was the guy with the camera. The guy with the camera, as we heard tonight, is the guy who never shows up in the pictures. So most every photograph is of Aldrin, including this one. Um, they walked amid what Buzz termed the magnificent desolation of Mare Tranquillitatis, collecting rocks to point experiments. They brought back 22 kilograms of rocks, making Apollo 11 the first successful sample and return mission to another world. A Soviet unmanned mission had failed only a few days previously. Armstrong samples are considered among the finest brought back by any astronaut. He was not a geologist by training, but he really had a knack for it. And three new minerals, R. Malcolite, portmanteau of their names, tranquilityite, and uh, pyroxferroite were discovered among the hall they brought back. Experiments included the seismic, seismic package Aldrin is deploying here, a laser reflector that still works if you aim a laser at it, and a solar wind experiment. Not a lot in the way of scientific stuff, but that was not the point. This was not a main scientific mission. Two and a half hours on the lunar surface, and it's time for a nap. There's no seats on the lab. Armstrong got the hammock. Buzz got the floor. <laughs> Neither of them slept well at all. There are also no curtains on the lab, and Armstrong said that the light of the earth was like a flashbulb. Meanwhile, Collins had more work to do. Since Armstrong had had to change Eagle's landing site on the fly, Mission Control didn't know exactly where they were, and they really did want to know for the moment when Eagle would lift off and try to rejoin Collins. So he's up there scribbling all over his panels, trying to do the math to figure out where they are. Ultimately, it was unsuccessful, and these weren't discovered until decades after the fact by curators at the Smithsonian. So it's like one little lunar mystery that popped up only a few years back. After 21 hours on the moon, it was time to go home to save weight. They jettisoned everything they didn't need including the camera, including bags of waste. So you can say, yes, humans land on another world, and within 24 hours, we've trashed the place. <laughs> yep, guilty. The moon gave its own back, though, because Eagle was now filled with lunar dust, which got everywhere and smelled like spent gunpowder. This is dust that had not been exposed to air ever. And when exposed to air, it's, it smelled pretty strange. Eagle's ascent engine had never been tested. The corrosive fuels made it a single use only. This was the most perilous moment of the mission. This was the part that had never been done before. And this was the moment Michael Collins had been dreading. President Nixon's uh, speechwriter, William Sapphire, had penned a backup speech informing America that the men who had gone to the moon would have to stay there forever. CBS News had pre-written obituaries ready to roll. But the engine worked. If you've seen the, frankly, terrible news footage of it, the American flag got knocked over in the process. So here's a lovely full-color artist rendering instead. Eagle took flight, went up to rendezvous with Columbia, and Armstrong later joked in a rare interview to CBS journalist Ed Bradley that he doubted Mike was pleased with all the dust that they tracked into his nice clean spaceship. 
In reality, Collins said that the site of the Lem return was the best site of his life. He had a pact around his neck of 18 contingency plans to rescue them, and he wouldn't have to use any of them. He was a happy man. He was so happy that when Buzz Oliver popped his head into the hatch of Columbia, Collins took him by the sides of the head and almost kissed him on the forehead before he got better of it and they just shook hands. <laughs> he did mind the mess that they made in the ship. So the ascent, the ascent stage of Eagle was then jettisoned, went floating off. Collins reported feeling relief at seeing her go. The whole business with the Lem had been nothing but a worry to him. Armstrong and Aldrin were sad because that was their baby. That was the crap that they had trained on and done historic things in. But now it was time to reform what Collins called the get us out of here, we do not want to be a permanent satellite of the moon orb. And they were off, homebound. Columbia's own engine fired, the crew were on the journey back to Earth, and somebody was keeping score. Here's a calendar. Again, we don't know who did this, my money's on Collins. It scratched off everything but Splashdown Day, a little thing that was discovered just a few years back. But they had a couple of final threats to face. One of them was a storm that caused them to alter their landing site in the Pacific. The other was that when the conical heat shielded part of the command module separated from the service module, the service module is supposed to skip harmlessly off the Earth's atmosphere like a stone across Lake Huron gone. It chased them down. That was not what NASA expected. It chased them down so closely Aldrin could see it out the window. And an airplane pilot reported watching it burn up and disintegrate. Um, if pieces had struck Columbia, that probably would have killed them all during re-entry. Thankfully, Columbia gem of the ocean splashed down. The astronauts were picked up by Navy divers who threw special containment suits to them. This was a very silly precaution against moon germs that wouldn't have worked if there had been moon germs because you open up a capsule that's floating in the Pacific, what happens? Yeah, the moon germs get out into the Pacific Ocean, then you've got moon monsters. Oh, it's silly. They stopped doing this after a couple of missions because there was no need. But in there, cute suits. They were whisked off to the aircraft carrier USS Hornet and got to meet with President Nixon from inside their containment tank. And I'm sure if Nixon knew about his uh, speech that Sapphire had written, he was very glad at that point he didn't have to deliver it. They were placed in a 21-day quarantine, but Collins did manage to sneak back out through the airtight tunnel into Columbia, which was still attached to the quarantine module and scribble one last message for posterity that we'll see in a bit. Once they were out of quarantine, they did a debriefing with mission control and communications personnel. Everybody understood then, finally, the full threat that the service module had posed on the descent. NASA launched an investigation and realized Apollo 8 and Apollo 10 had similarly been in danger. Uh, the reason that this stayed out of the news is it was only declassified right around the time of Apollo 13 and everybody had other things to worry about. Then it was time to celebrate with the rest of the world. Armstrong, Collins, Aldrin, and their wives went off on a goodwill tour that covered 24 countries in 45 days. Here they are in Mexico City, handsomely attired. Here they all are with the Pope. They met royalty. They met world leaders of spiritual kinds, political kinds, everything. But none of them would fly in space again. Collins was offered the chance. He turned it down. He could have been the commander of Apollo 17, which turned out to be the last mission to go to the moon, but he did not want to put Joan and the kids through anything like that ever again. He said he was content with what he'd achieved. Armstrong did want the chance to fly again. But he didn't say it directly to management, who then gently suggested he might be happy in a desk job. And he realized that, like John Glenn before him, he was now a national treasure and was not going anywhere. John Glenn had to become a senator to be able to get onto <laughs> another spacecraft. Neil Armstrong was not that kind of guy. So two years after Paul 11, he left NASA. And he went to teach aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati in his native Ohio. 
He returned to the public eye briefly in the 1980s as chairman of the Rogers Commission, investigating the loss of the Space Shuttle Challenger, vice chairman rather, and also to pitch for Chrysler. I vaguely remember Neil Armstrong as a Chrysler ad man. Armstrong died in 2012 of complications from heart surgery. He was 83. He had lived to see the 40th anniversary, uh, which brought him back with his crewmates for a reunion. He remained reticent and modest to the end. His marriage to his first wife, Jan, had ended in 94 after a long separation. He survived by his second wife, Carol, and his sons by Jan, Rick, and Mark. They played an advisory role in First Man, the full-scale theatrical release about his life based on his authorized biography that was released last year, which I do recommend checking out. It, it's got some really stunning sequences. The statue at Armstrong's alma mater of Purdue, unveiled in 2007 with his input, shows him the way he wants to be remembered. A 1950s engineering student with a slide roll. He never felt he deserved the attention he got, and he always acknowledged the efforts of the 400,000 people at his back that got him on the moon. Meanwhile, Michael Collins left the Air Force in 1970 at the rank of a major general. He went to his adopted hometown of Washington, D.C., worked briefly in the State Department, and then became the first director of the National Air and Space Museum, part of the Smithsonian, which, when it opened in 1976, became the most popular museum in the world. He wrote a wonderful lyrical memoir, Carrying the Fire, in 1973, a must read for any space enthusiast. Um, Apollo program offered Jeffrey Kluger, who is Jim Lovell's co-writer in the book that became Apollo 13, just came out with a new book on Apollo 8. He's called Collins a poet laureate of the astronaut corps. And while that may be a low bar in some cases, it is totally deserved. He's often described as happy to be forgotten, but in the wake of Armstrong's death, he's become more visible. Like, here's a public appearance he did at MIT in 2015. So he's been out there celebrating the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. If you go to Google today and click there, Google Doodle, there's a beautiful little animation narrated by him. So he's been out in the public eye a lot more in the last six months. And I brought a great graphic novel that came out two years ago called The Far Side of the Moon, celebrating his achievements. He and Jones stayed married until she died in 2014, which a uh, rare accomplishment for one of the space race astronauts. But where the senior members of the crew shunned the limelight and got on with their lives, Buzz Aldrin embraced his role as a moonwalker but had a lot of trouble doing it. Uh, his first post-NASA job was as commandant of the U.S. Air Force Aerospace Research Pilot School in California. The job proved stressful, and he suffered from depression to the point that he had to be hospitalized. He retired from the Air Force at the rank of a colonel in 71 when they stripped astronaut training from the school's curriculum. He penned a couple of memoirs of his own, Return to Earth and Magnificent Desolation, which chronicled the struggles he faced, including alcoholism, multiple divorces. Low points include selling cars, used cars, and he wasn't very good at that. He also got arrested for disorderly conduct in, uh, I think it was 1978, before he sobered up. It took him many years to deal with being the second man on the moon. But he's a happy man now. He changed his name formally to Buzz Aldrin in the early 1980s. His latter-day accomplishments include being the oldest person to reach the South Pole, being the oldest person to fly with the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds, appearing as himself on movies and television shows like Dancing with the Stars, rapping with Snoop Dogg, <laughs> serving as an inspiration for the character Buzz Lightyear in the Toy Story movies, and punching a moon landing denier in the face. <laughs> Meanwhile, up on the moon, the Eagle's descent stage remains at the Sea of Tranquility. Photos from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter taken in 2012 revealed her landing site in high-definition detail, right down to Neil Armstrong's camera. Her ascent stage was left in lunar orbit where it eventually degraded and crashed into the moon and has not yet been found. Since Eagle, LEM-5, never returned to Earth, her predecessor, LEM-2, which was never used, has been modified to look like Eagle, and that's what you can see on display at the Smithsonian in the Lunar Exploration Vehicle Gallery. Um, Armstrong visited her in a rare full-scale interview he did in 2005, 
and admitted she was probably the ugliest flying machine ever designed. I like it. As for Columbia, she toured the globe and then moved into her new home at the National Air and Space Museum, where she was reunited with her pilot, Director Collins. She is currently on a two-year tour. I caught up with her last year in Houston at their space center. She's in Seattle right now, and if you want to pay your respects, she will be in Cincinnati at the end of the year before she goes back home to DC. This is where we can leave off with the end of the story as it is today and the message that was left in Columbia by the man who knew her best, Spacecraft 107, alias Apollo 11, alias Columbia, the best ship to come down the line, God bless her, from Michael Collins. Um, there's some books that I've cited if you want to check them out. And of course, you know, moment of respect for the commander. In his wonderfully understated way, the moon is an interesting place to be. <coughs> I recommend it. <laughs> Any questions? Which made with a person on it, yeah. Apollo 7 oh, used a okay. Saturn 1B. Yeah, there were unmanned tests of the Saturn 5, but this is the first time they put humans on top of that monster and sent it someplace. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> and, uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the, the returning thing off the moon, it was like a single sh uh, use rocket and they could, couldn't test it? Single use engine, yeah. Yeah. Didn't they have other engines that they could have used? Oh, well they, they used, they knew the design worked, but that particular engine had not been tested. So if there had been some kind of flaw in that particular engine, that particular, any part of it, they might have been sunk. But, but why use that design, why use that type of engine that had corrosive fuel? It's more efficient. It, it's Plus a you're, lot you're, more efficient. You're guaranteed to start. Yeah. Basically, because of the chemicals. As soon as the chemicals mix, you're off and running. There's no uncertainty. I mean, part of the reason that the Soviet program was behind us is they were trying to make do with non toxic fuels that wouldn't do that sort of thing. So, there's a trade off. Any other questions? Yes. How long did it take to lend the crash into the, the moon? I. Matter of weeks or months, it didn't take long. It, it had nothing to stabilize it. Did they have any issues with radiation protection? They didn't really. They not known about back then? Or? They knew. They measured what all the Gemini and Apollo astronauts were exposed to. In fact, they, they knew that the people who got past the Van Allen belts got a lot of radiation. Um, we got lucky. We simply got lucky that the sun did not do a major ejection at any point during these programs. Probably one of the biggest concerns they had the whole program at that point. Yeah. The astronauts said that they could actually close their eyes and see streaks of light they, go through their. They totally could. Yeah. yeah. From cosmic rays? Yep. Yeah. Yes. At the time, I had great confidence in the submission. I was 15, and as I learned more about it, I realized just how many close calls they had, how risky it was. In your opinion, do you think they were kind of pushing the envelope a little bit or a lot with the technology you know how they had at the time? So I have a two-part answer. One of them is the Apollo mission that had the fewest anomalies, the fewest things that went wrong, was Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. So it's not the sheer number of things that went wrong, it's what goes wrong. Mm -hmm. The other one is, yes, I my personal feeling on it is this was a civilian program, but it evolved from a military test pilot culture. All of the original astronauts who were recruited from the test pilot culture, their jobs involved death-defying cutting-edge equipment. And in fact, with the space program, they at least had the opportunity to do simulators. With a test pilot in a plane, you're the first person flying that plane. There, there was at the time no culture of test pilot simulation. So for many of these people, it was a seamless transition from putting their necks on the line for a new experimental fighter jet to putting their necks on the line for a spacecraft. As NASA evolved from a military test pilot 
astronaut corps, to a civilian test pilot, to a much more broader, uh, we've got scientists, we've got humanities people, we've got a diverse group, the risks become less acceptable. The, it's rooted in a test pilot culture, but that's not what we have anymore. And even by partway through the Apollo program, that's not what they had anymore. So the risks become more apparent and more daunting. How did they navigate? Uh, did they do star stuff? or? They were all trained in doing star stuff. They could do star stuff. They did star stuff to a limited extent, particularly on Apollo 13, but the computers did a lot. They, you, we all have you know, Okay, the, the computers had less power than a pocket calculator. Yeah, but they're not designed to be a pocket calculator. It's right. designed to get somebody to the moon and back, and they did it very well. Yes? So how many photos of Neil Armstrong, how many colored photos of Neil Armstrong are there on the moon? Because there's a famous one that you showed where he's reflected in Buzz Aldrin's visor, but are there other ones, or is that the only one? There is another one, at least, and there seems to be a couple taken by Aldrin before he threw the camera down. They're not great pictures, but I have seen at this point more than one. Everybody's opened their archives in recent months, so whether it's National Geographic or uh, the Smithsonian or NASA, and there's all these pictures available that I couldn't find even a year ago. And so I found some fairly undignified pictures of Neil Armstrong apparently taken by Buzz before he threw in the camera. There's also a really undignified one of Buzz Cousin coming backward down the ladder. <laughs> it's great. Um, how come the ladder was so short? Was it a packing problem, you know, problem or something? Um, what, why I was mean, there like two steps missing or something? You know, oh, it, yeah. It was for weight. Yeah, they oh, were trying to shave off everything possible. So for a guy at Neil Armstrong's height, it was easy. Pete Conrad, the next guy to go to the moon, said that may have been a small step for Neil, but it was a pretty big jump for Neil because <laughs> Conrad was like five foot three. How did they get back up the ladder? Slowly. High. Well, you can, no, less gravity. Oh, well, once it's gravity, and once it's, gravity right it's a lot easier, yeah. even if you're in a space suit. Right. Right. Yes? I, how many times did Carol's um, orbit the moon before? Um, I think 17. 17 times? Yeah, oh. I think 17. Hmm. So you said for part of the spacewalk, Aldrin went off and did something and, and Armstrong went off and did something? What what were they doing at that stage? Is that unplanned time? Or? Our Aldrin was doing his work. Armstrong took a detour to Little West Crater, which is, I think it's on the original map, and hung out at Little West Crater for a fairly short period of time during which, again, his heart rate spiked. So it is thought that he was performing some kind of personal something at the rim of the crater. The movie First Man made a dramatic choice based on conversations with the family. We don't know. We may never know, but there's some hope we'll learn when the uh, contents of his personal stash are unsealed. Mm -hmm. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter could see their, his footprints, in fact. Yes, and the wheelbarrow tracks in the later missions. Yeah, the LRO is great. I was able to convince a moon denier to stop being a moon denier using yeah. those images. They saw his tracks go to the crater and come back. Yeah. And they wow. said there were there five or ten minutes of no conversation during that time. Yeah, it's some, something something happened, but we just don't know what yet. Hopefully we will next year. One more from Joe. Okay, um, as far as the ladder being too short, the movie that we just watched about Apollo 11, didn't they say that it then settled down into the surface as far as they thought? Not as far as they thought, but as far as they feared. Because there were some people who had speculated that the blanket of dust on the surface might be five or six feet deep. Mm -hmm. So Armstrong's letting everybody know it's a couple of inches. That there were people who were thinking that they need to basically throw down depth charges to, to figure out if it was even safe to go down. And no, it's a couple inches of dust. It's fine. Okay. But I thought I, it seemed like they had made the comment that the ladder was short because of because the the module didn't settle down as far as they anticipated. Mm, not so much. Okay. It, it was mostly a weight-based issue. Yeah, but they were originally they originally didn't even want a ladder to, to say what they wanted to kind yeah, of the the yes. 
And of course, the ladder was integrated into the leg of the lamb to be as efficient as possible. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for coming out.